Hey, Professor. This is not there. Okay, let's get started. Seven. It's not yet seven thirty. Uh, friend, you are asking something. Oh yeah, uh, I, I was just wanting to ask one quick question about the project. If that's okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let me see. Yeah, seven thirty. Yeah, let's cool. start. Um, so I just wanted to find out because the introduction and the requirements section for project three is going to be almost identical to project two. Are we like, is there any way to make it so Turnitin won't trigger on our own work or do we just have to rewrite that stuff? Like, like, like obviously we'll have to add a, a bit about it being a mixed level design instead of just a behavior level design. But like a lot of, a lot of it could, could be copy pasted otherwise, but that'll trigger Turnitin as far as I understand. Uh, I'm not sure if it is the own work if Turnitin takes it. <clears throat> At least in the past semester, I did not face uh, any problem due to the Turnitin score for most of you, except for maybe uh, two or three cases, uh, which was justifiably was high Turnitin score. Uh, but other than that, it didn't happen. So I'm not sure if they partially copied from the previous project or not in the similar situation. Uh, but as far as I know, if you uh, like re like rewrite them or at least copy paste and rephrase for the gate level project and that your dialogue oriented towards the gate level uh, mentality, then uh, targeting score should not be a problem. Okay. So and yeah, maybe it won't even trigger on our own. I, I haven't submitted, so I don't know for sure. I was just assuming. Yeah. Right, right, right. And if it is, uh, if it is more than the like the target level of the target score, it's not the end of the world. Like what the process goes through is that I uh, come back to you, ask for explanation, and if I am satisfied that okay, there is no plagiarism or such thing happens, then you can escalate it to the university. Right. So not that it's, you got a 30% TIS uh, where target is 25% and immediately something got reported to the university. No, it doesn't work that way. I need to work with individual students and check their work uh, line by line and listen to their explanation and then decide myself whether it is a case of plagiarism or it is a case of such case like that, you said that, hey, I copied from my own project and here that's why the similarity score. But yeah, I haven't seen such cases so far. So my belief is that if it is your own work, maybe we don't check. Maybe. I'm not sure, 100%. Oh, okay. Thanks, Professor. <clears throat> Hi, Professor. Yes. Uh, can I ask a question about like uh, the fifth part of the project? So. So I just finished doing the D flip flop and I just finished part five of it. So I'm wondering, is it this D flip flop, is it a negative edge trigger D flip flop or a positive? Because from the truth table in your notes and from like the comments that were on the, what that were on like the Verilog file that you gave us, it said that uh, the D flip flop is a negative, is a positive edge trigger D flip flop. But in your video, yeah, it was negative. Uh, Positive edge trigger. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> on the slide I copied from the the class notes that was discussed that the flip flop construction. This was we constructed a negative deep flip flop. I believe in that specific source file. It is I think logic dot v file where the templates are given. I believe there is template for both the negative edge trigger deep flip flop and positive edge trigger deep flip flop. Uh, but at the end of the day, your register file or the register are to be constructed out of the positive edge trigger D flip. Oh, okay. And um, so, so I think in your the notes in your in the lab notes, it was also a positive edge D flip flop because I, I looked at like all the signals and when. When the uh, when the C when the clock turns to one, 
it begins to, I think, I think it begins to, it holds the, the D value when the clock turns to one. So because it, from zero to one, uh, it, because from zero to one, the D is, is held in, and reflected in Q, then it's a positive edge trigger flip-flop in your notes, I think. I and, do uh, remember um, which, which lab number was this. I can quickly. Uh, it was lab number five. Lab number five. Yeah, but lab five is more like behavior model, right? No? Oh, I meant like five out of seven of the, let me check. I think it's lab 15 then. 15, okay. Lab 15. Yeah, these are all slides from, okay, let me, why don't I share so that everyone on the same page. Yeah, so basically uh, you see these, uh, uh, these uh, slides, uh, these are all copied from these are all copied from your uh, theoretical study. Uh, so this is, let me see, clock. No, this is the clock. One. Yeah, this is a negative edge trigger. This is the negative edge trigger. You need to build a positive edge trigger. It's basically, uh, you know, like, let me, uh, why don't I annotate this? Uh, so for the uh, positive yeah, you, you remove, yeah, you move. yeah, you move it. Yeah, so you basically need to go here and this guy need to go there. So you change the, you change the, uh, this inverter position where it is connected. Instead of connecting output of this inverter uh, to the uh, slave side, you connect it to the master side. And vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, also, can you go back, go to the slide four, the last slide, on the on this, yeah, there. Uh, like the truth table of the flip flop, like the slide four. Mm -hmm. So is is this a positive edge triggered flip flop? Because to me, it seems like that. Because when C is equal to one, which means when C goes from zero to one, it's saving, it's reflecting the D into the Q, which means it's holding, holding it at that, at when C turns from zero to one. So it's positive edge triggered flip-flop here, right? Like, so I'm not sure. One, zero to one. Yeah, it is one, uh, let me see, zero, zero, one, one. E, yeah, you are right. You are right. It, it, this is for the positive edge trigger. Okay, so the table is positive edge, but the diagram is a negative edge flip flop. Right. So, we to, so we just had to change that position of the inverter. Right. right. Yes. Okay, thank you. All right, what else? So we are uh, in the cache memory, cache memory system. Um, and we talked about the cache structure and how the how uh, the address and all the different types of information like block address index, etc., are uh, computed within uh, within the uh, for cache accessing. Uh, one point to notice, note that there in that lecture that you need to be very clear cache storage and actual cache device size, they are different. What I mean is uh, like, let's say a cache um, a block size is uh, one kilobyte and it has 1024 cache line. That means your cache, cache storage is, is storing 1024 blocks of one kilobyte of Block size, that means it is like a one megabyte uh, of storage, cache storage. But that is not the cache device size. Cache device size is more than that. Uh, it is basically add on to that storage amount. 
that is cache storage plus the extra information bits it needs for example it need to uh, it need to store the tags okay it need to have all those control bit uh, cache line validity bit etc cetera, etc cetera. so to calculate the device cache device size we need to add up those extra information sizes as well to compute that okay and uh, let's uh, take an example let's uh, let's work to an example about how these cache lines are accessed with and means etc and in that process i will try to describe uh, this uh, part as well storage versus the actual cache device size uh, let me share my screen with you so you see that uh, You see that like a cache, the size, uh, sorry, storage is basically, let's say if this is the whole cache, this is the whole cache in this part, forget about this, this is just the index number. There's nothing physical about that. But this part is your total cache device and storage is this part. So let's say there are 1024 lines and each line is actually storing one kilobyte of block, then you have total storage of one megabyte. But the cache size is you add up the cache block size plus number of tag bit plus the control bit. In this example, this is only one control bit, but in reality, there will be more than one uh, control bits, and we need to add them add them together and if some problems are given in that line you will definitely are given will be given with number of bits at least in the control field tag number of tag bits can be derived from other information but not the control bit at least uh, so that should be given to you okay um now Uh, this example, this example is given, it's starting with a block address. It's starting with a block address. And we all remember, uh, hopefully you all remember, what is the relation between block address and address. So your microprocessor, microprocessor issues an address, let's say A, to the memory system, which is like maybe some bit. Okay, some number of bit, 32 bit, 64 bit, doesn't matter. Address is no, number of bits. And then let's say block size is, um, let's say S. S is a block size. I'm not sure what, what I put as a block size in the slide, but let's take S as a block size. Then my block address, B is A D S. Okay. Block address is A mod, I mean, isn't it? <coughs> so we need an address and line index has to be very unique. Yeah, so this is mod. This is, this should be mod. Okay, uh, just hold on. Let me just double check on my claim.
Okay, so your block address is a div s and index within the block within block is i mod of s mod of s okay so this problem starts with a block address this part so this part is calculated start with this part and here we need to compute two different things one is the cache line number which is let's say it's called c which is b mod of number of line in the cache number of line number of cache line okay let's say it's called a l okay and your tag t is b div l okay b div l so with that in this problem what we need to do we know the l for this problem we can count we can count there are eight so in this problem your l equals eight which is by the way two to the power three and this is important i'll come to that why it is important and then your uh, other part is uh, what we have given the block address yeah i think that's that's sufficient information for us to go through now you see there are uh, these uh, addresses and we can definitely uh, go through their values which is like the first one is in the decimal we can check it is uh, 2 4 6 8 16 1 2 4 8 16 so this is 16 21 this is 21 and this is uh, this what uh, 16 plus 8 24 plus 2 26 and so on and so forth right and then with using these formulas we can actually calculate uh, for example this guy is uh, 21 by cash line right so tag let's can compute the tag first it is 8 21 by 8 so tag is 2 and your cash line is a remainder which is a mod operation which is 21 mod 8 I think it is five, which is in binary, five is one, one, zero, and this is one, zero. So we can go this way, or, or we can do something like, you see this number of line is a power of T. And if we divide a number of by that, if we divide a number, we divide a value with a value which is power of two, what we can do in the binary number formation, we can simply divide them at that position. Third position, we can take this three bit, which will become my. remainder which is like my mod operation value okay which is one one zero and the other part is my d is my d which is my tag for this operation so in this way we don't really need to calculate anything with the calculator or 
on paper or anything. We can just look at the number of bits associated in that number of cache line, and then just divide the bits given block address bit into two parts and use one part as a cache line number and other part as a tag. In that way, uh, so what will happen here? In this case, we let's say it is a power up state, right? Your cache, nothing is there. And you see the valid bit, it is, it is not valid. No line is valid. So what system will do, it will access your cache line 110, which is here, and match with the validity, if it is not, then it will trigger loading of that block in the cache memory. So 110, and after that, let's say it just loaded something, okay? It just loaded something, some data came in, 110. Some data and then what it will do, it will basically change this guy to yes. Now it is valid and it will place the tag one zero there, okay? And then access within this block and return that corresponding data, okay? Within that block, which is which is by this way, indexed within the book. Okay. That specific data is returned to the microprocessor. Now, processor moves on to the next access, right? So, we calculate similarly, we calculate the next one. The cache line would be my 0, 1, 0, and block, and the tag would be 1, 1. Okay, one one. So now what will be done here? Will it will access your line, cash line zero one zero, which is here. Valid is no. So it will possibly have some data loaded onto there. Zero one zero. Corresponding block will be loaded. And this guy will change to Y, and a tag will be written for this guy, which is 1, 1. Okay. And then data is written from that block. Now, processor move to the next one. Next one is this one, which is my cache line would be 110, and my tag will be 10. Okay. So in that case, your system, the system will access 110 here. It sees a valid bit, okay, that's fine. And my tag is 10, which matches, okay? Oh, we forgot to uh, count the hit or miss. So this is, will be miss here, miss here. Now will be hit at this case. And it will return the data. Next, it will move on to the next address, which is 11010, next block address. And we can calculate the cache line as 010, tag as 11, which is 010 is here, is a valid data, tag matches. So it becomes a hit for me, and data is written. Now it moves on to the next one. And we compute the cache line as 0, 0, 0, tag as 1, 0. And then what will happen? Cache line 0, not a valid. So it's a miss. It's a miss. And data will be loaded onto here, onto that line. This guy will become y and tag one zero will be stored there. And then, and then, we 
it moves to the next axis, which is going to be, my cache line is going to be 0, 1, 1, cache 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. 0, 1, 1 is right here, 0, 1, 1. It's not valid, it's a miss. And then the data will be loaded, 0, 1, 1. And tag will be written there as 0, 0. Turn to Y is the valid bit. And then next access, 1, 0, 0, which will give me line 0, 0, 0 as cache line, tag as 1, 0. So it will access here, valid bit yes. Tag matches, it's a hit which returns from that, that location, returns from that location. And how about here? Uh, now, here we have a tag, uh, cache line is 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. Okay, so it is hit here, 0, 1, 0. It's uh, valid, but see the tag is not matching. So that calls for replacement. So this data will be replaced with a new data, new information. This, now this one will be changed to <coughs> tag one zero. And there's nothing to do with the valid bit. It, it still remain Y and the data is data is written. So in this case, it is a miss. <coughs> now with respect to this three, uh, this eight operation, what is my hitch rate or miss, let's say miss rate? Miss rate is we simply count it, right? Eight operation, we have two, four, five. <coughs> five miss, five by eight, which is Percentage wise, five uh, percent, right? This many, which is uh, da, 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 2.5 multiplied by 25, which is like 62.25, I believe. Let me use the calculator to just make sure. Five five eight. Uh, sixty two point five. Six two point five. It's a very, very high rate of means. We are actually looking for the heat rate, which is almost like ninety five percent, ninety nine percent heat rate. Uh, that's what our desirable goal, but at this in this case, in this example, it is 62.5, which is actually a like real scenario. Remember, we started with the empty cache, like power up. And in any in many, any machine, if we once we power up and the process starts, then initial accesses will be missed. Initial accesses will be missed and if we just snapshot on the initial couple of cycles, like eight, 10, 50 accesses, we'll see, we'll observe a high miss. Rate. But as time passes by, as the execution goes on for longer time, then you'll see the miss rate starts to go down dramatically and heat rate comes up dramatically because now it will be more heat and more heat because uh, this cache is kind of full uh, and all the data are present there and you can serve the processor with the, with the requested data. So just don't get be alarmed with this very high miss rate with this example. Reason is that the cache was empty to start with. And it's expected that we have high miss rate. Question?
No? Okay. I don't have then anything else to share with you tonight. If you don't have any other questions or anything, um, we can close the class tonight then, early. Let me work on the... A, sorry, I have a question about a okay. project tree. Mm -hmm. um, so for the reset, I wonder how do we reset the instruction register to the, the initial address, which is the 1000 in hex. Mm -hmm. For example, because what I know is from the text bench that the reset will be uh, five nanosecond, which include only half clock cycle. I wonder how that, uh, how do we... Uh, yeah, it's an asynchronous reset, right? It's an asynchronous reset. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. but we still have to reset it to a value, right? Yeah, reset which it to a value, so you cannot load it, right? So that means, uh, let me show you uh, quickly. Conceptually, okay. what you need to do here, let's take an example. Let's say this is a four bit register. So four bit register conceptually means what? Conceptually, it has four registers, right? Let me just uh, dump it. So you have four registers. And you have reset and preset, right? You know that reset, if you set it to one and preset to zero, it will change the value to zero. And otherwise it will, other configuration, it changes to one. So let's concentrate on this part, okay? And let's say you want to have an initial like reset value as maybe one, one, zero, one. Let's set this bit pattern. So in externally, if any reset comes in, this has to be done, right? So reset, and it is also on what? Uh, active low or active high? Do you remember? Yeah. Is active low means what? If I reset to one, then it reset the system, right? So it's active high. Hmm. It doesn't matter. It depends on what the spec is, but the idea is the same. So this guy, and I need to set So we need to create a special register for this. Okay, so that way, if the reset signal comes in, it's a preset configuration for this guy, right? So that means it will up this guy as a one, and then this guy as a one, this guy as zero, because here, the reset is connected to the reset, not to the preset. Preset is the zero. And then it is one. So you need to create like two special registers, one for stack pointer and another for another for program counter, this 32-bit register, where you inside, when you instantiate this individual uh, individual registers you basically uh, tie up the reset signal either to the preset or reset accordingly what you are trying to do, which pattern you are trying to uh, achieve at the, at the power up uh, power up sequence. I see, thank, thank you. Okay, Jacqueline say, do we need to add a preset port to the register? They're not a part of the input ports. Uh, uh, preset. Uh, 
I think if you need, you can create one special register for you. Don't change the change the uh, ports for the given modules. Okay, do not change the port for the given modules because uh, our unit test depends on the port name and port sequence, etc. So in that case, if you need, if our original register does not have a preset port, create one new uh, module for that one. You can use any name there because we're not going to test that directly, that register directly. So you can create one with the preset port and use that on this special register of program counter and, and, the, and the stack port. Jacqueline, is that okay? Okay, what else? Um, I have a quick question on lab 13. 13, uh, yeah. Yeah, so in that lab, it says we need to implement a 32-bit and, and mm -hmm. then we need to put it in the logic 32-bit.v file. Mm -hmm. Is it mandatory to put it in that file? Because I already created it, but I put it in a different file and I'm, I'm not uh, sure if I should move it. Uh, you should move it, you should move it. I'm not, yeah, I'm not 100% sure if I uh, compile the, source code partially to test for the unit test. So it's better to like, like maintain whatever structure is given. To you. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Uh, so professor? Yes. Uh, so when you were talking about like the stack pointer and the register, like mm -hmm. we have to create a special 32 bit register for it, right? So mm -hmm. we have this default 32-bit register that we uh, that we implemented in uh, lab lab 15, mm -hmm. but for the stack pointer we need to make make another 32-bit register using right. the 32 one-bit registers. But now we have to uh, like manipulate like change the like change the values of the. So you have the reset that's coming in, and you have to for every individual one bit register inside, you have to either put that wire to the preset or the reset side and put the other and put the other side to zero, right? Right, right. So, so like for, for our like different, like our stack pointer and PC, we have to create a 32 bit uh, register, a special one for each one of those, right? In order to do the reset to the, to the unique address. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, you one can do a little more complicated uh, coding there, uh, which called we call it a parameterized uh, module, which can take a pattern and connect the uh, preset and reset accordingly in the genvar loop. But it is little compli complicated code. Simplest is to would be to just use the like create two separate register, specialized register for these two purposes and connect them manually uh, with the reset accordingly. Yeah, so for, for those registers, we should, shouldn't really use the gen var since there's no, there's no like actual pattern because yet for each one you have to, like may, maybe there is a pattern, but like for each of those 32 one bit registers, you have to mm -hmm. connect the preset, like the preset and reset individually for each one, right? Because, because it's like, uh, like some pattern, like some pattern, like, like uh, that's the, address so we have to connect each each one of those ports to like the different uh to like preset or or put one or like put one to like zero for the port for the reset of preset right yes in a sense yes uh, but what i'm saying uh, if you want to do a little complicated code it's more like this um, Let's say this is a variable. This is a, let's say this is a variable, a very log register or some other kind of variable which takes the pattern. Okay, let's say four bit pattern, right? Then you can access each of the bit value in the P0, P1, this way, right? So in general, you can do PI, right? And then in if it is a genware, if this guy is a genware, based on that, you can test it 
right? And this is your dot reset, let's say. Based on that, if it is pattern is one, uh, this is true, then uh, set it to zero, otherwise reset. And for the preset patterns, when you are connecting that, test on the PI, and either it is reset or zero. Something like that. You can still do a little complicated coding with the, the gen word and given a pattern value. Okay, so what would P be? Like, would it be a register, a wire, or what? It would be a register. It's a constant value. You can make it an integer as well. It is just a value that you are accessing using this uh, uh, subscript operation. That oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let right, me make sense. dig out if I have similar code, I can share with everyone. Uh, if okay. Similar code. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay, then if we don't have other questions, we can stop tonight, uh, work on the project three, get it done. And then uh, next week is a, a one day, a day. We have one day class on Monday. Wednesday is a, is a break, is a holiday uh, for Thanksgiving, long weekend for you guys. So submit your project and go peacefully into your long weekend. Okay. Oh, sorry, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, so for the uh, data path, I was just wondering because, like, for example, um, when you're initializing your PC counter like value mm -hmm. um, in a data path. Like I was wondering like uh, how should we kind of like give the initial like value of the like PC counter then for the data path? Because so data path, data path has this PC register, right? And you are, you are creating a specific special register for program counter. It is not the generic register. It is a, PC 32 bit register. And inside there, you are instantiating the individual bit of the registers with this specific configuration connecting reset signals, especially to either preset or reset, depending on what bit pattern you want to see. So that means if you are sending a system wide reset, your program counter will be resetted to that specific bit pattern, right? You don't need to send anything else. That's okay. Me. Did I get your question correct or something? Else? Uh, um, I, about the uh, latter, like I kind of understand, but um, I think in the beginning you said that we already have a register for PC counter in the data path module, or as like no, an input. No, or? data path. Data path. You need to. You need to create. You need to create. Oh, okay. Data path, remember, data path is a blank module given to you. you need yeah. To yeah right inside that. So you need to instantiate the probes to this special program counter register there. Okay, so it's basically we're creating a register and then we just pass in the um, value of the program count, the initial value of the program counter into that register, right? Uh, if you want to go in that way, like it is called a parameterized programming, parameterized description, where you pass a bit pattern there, but other than that, you can create a hard-coded module itself. Like let's say module name is called PC register 32 bit. Okay. Uh -huh. After that, you instantiate 32 registers and connect the reset signal to its either reset or preset terminal accordingly what pattern you want to want to be reseted to. Oh, so okay. 32 bit pattern for the power up for the PC for our case, right? So uh -huh. you hard, hardware, hard code that connection of the reset to either reset or preset to make it to set it to one or zero, depending on what pattern you want to set there. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, I see. So it, it is one very specific customized register definition, module definition for just program counter. Uh, okay. Generic, generic component. Mm -hmm. And about the other one, the first like um, solution you talked about, the parameterized programming, uh, how will we do that? Is it a keyword or is it like, what is that? Uh, parameterized it is like, you can take an example of the memory where we are passing the uh, initialization file for the memory as a parameter. 
with a dot param statement i believe and and there is oh. this, yeah go and look at the definition of the mm. memory module itself there is some uh, some variable defined as a parameter variable which can oh, be is it um, def param yeah it's, oh. exactly exactly oh uh, okay okay so in uh. this module you can you can have a def param and then access the bit pattern according to the one i showed you in the jamboard that use the genvar index as a bit position on the pattern and test have a uh, trinary function there to which test the bit and based on the result of outcome of the bit either it replaces that with zero or reset in that generation se sequence mm -hmm. and then when we instantiate that specific register you can actually do like pass the parameter dot param these as the as the initialization uh, uh, sequence initialization pattern of the program counter and then initialization uh, pattern on the on the stack point okay 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 i see thank you yeah let let me dig up like i may have some example there i can probably share with everyone just watch out in the discussion for the project too if i find out any i will post it uh, and professor where where would we put these custom 32 bit registers like it doesn't matter you can you can file? choose your own file yeah you can choose uh, either logic b logic 32 bit it doesn't matter because i am not going to test it like individually that part right so okay. it doesn't matter and also do we have to use param like in the like similar to the memory module or can we just use like an internal register that has the uh, that has the bit pattern for no, no, you don't have to you don't have to so we can use a register with a bit pattern inside uh, yeah. in order to like set all the signals yeah. uh, to set all of, like the components i mean yeah okay all right thank you okay then good night everybody and see you in next week monday Thank you, Professor.